and happy new year to all of you. We can come to the on the first uh, January. So that's very hearty greetings and best wishes. First of all, let me thank Mr. Madhu for taking the initiative to invite me for this uh, one meeting. Although I have a number of Rotary Club meetings, but uh, every Rotary Club meeting has its own charm and its own uh, uh, variety, I suppose. Well, when uh, Mr. Madhu asked me what is the subject on which I will talk, I mentioned recently I had given a VD Deshmukh Memorial Lecture on governance, good governance. I said, maybe it is easy for me if I can take the same subject. So he agreed and uh, I'm very happy to be with you all this evening. First of all, I should start with a quotation from Nani Parkiwala, whose uh, 100th birth anniversary is being celebrated now. He said, India is a rich country, but managed poorly, or has been able to keep them poor, that's what he said. It's very uh, much true because in spite of the variety, diversity, and the remarkable resources that we have all over the country, of which I had a personal knowledge because I have been, I have traveled almost every part of this country. In spite of that, after 72 years of independence, we are still knocking at the doors of poverty to get rid of it. And um, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, the constitution which spoke of socialism, spoke of secularism, which speaks of um, equality of uh, law, equality before law, and um, liberty and fraternity. We still witness so much of uh, violence, hatred, and uh, intolerance in this country. Not necessarily because of uh, poor government, but partly due to that. But um, the unfortunate aspect is that the cultural legacy that we have had before independence. Unfortunately, that is uh, not getting the uh, importance that it deserved. Uh, the country had, as, as you know, Lord Macaulay in 1823 or so, in his address to the British Parliament said, This is a country where there is so much of harmony, there is so much of understanding, there is no theft, there is no robber here. Until he said, If you have to dominate this nation, you have to give them English education and make them forget their cultural past. That's how it started. So our decay uh, in, uh, in cultural decay perhaps started uh, much uh, about a few centuries back. But be that as it may, the governance record of this country prior to say uh, 1000 AD or whatever has been remarkably good. And we have had some of the brilliant uh, rulers who are probably more democratic than the modern politicians. <coughs> Governance uh, in particularly South India, governance in some parts of North India like uh, Baroda, Jaipur, and so on, even Kashmir, uh, it was excellent at one stage. But uh, over a period of time, our governance has suffered, uh, partly because of our own indifference. I won't, see, you can't be blaming uh, the colonial rulers, uh, at least now, for the poor state of governance in many areas. And uh, what is very important now is we have to make a serious attempt to see that the governance record of India changes substantially in the years to come. The, one of the things that uh, we normally talk about good governance is to have fairness in administration, tolerance in dealing with people, accountability in all matters relating to public delivery of goods and transparency in our transactions, particularly transactions from the government side. And I always say that every budget that was presented from 1947, in spite of the fact many have been hailed and some of them have done remarkable changes, it's every budget in my opinion is a missed opportunity because so many things could have been done the state of affairs in this country, uh, particularly in matters relating to poverty, public health, and uh, education. But somehow or other, we have been uh, dangling along and we have been not making any specific uh, changes which will really make us be proud. 
Although technologically we have got probably the best brains, and in many countries we have been shining very well. But is it uh, unfortunate that things are not happening so well in this country? We have done very well in industry in certain areas, but then if you look at the broad macro picture of public administration in this country, there are many areas where we need to change. And in particular, apart from the central government with which I have been associated for more than 30 years, the state governments in various states have been very, um, I don't want to say inefficient, have been very lethargic in uh, dealing with public issues. It's a very sad state of affairs. Things are improving at a very slow pace. It is, that is the grievance I have. Although 32 years of independence, we could have done so much, much more than what we have. Because many countries like Germany, Japan, Singapore, of course, small countries, they've all done so well after 1940s, after the Second World War. But the is that we have not been able to achieve good governance. And uh, that is why I said it's a crying need of this country now to bring about not incremental changes, but surgical changes to see that the performance of public administration is um, adequate enough to meet the yields of the country, yields of the state. Now, as far as the remedies which are required, I have broadly detailed. As a democracy, Bertrand Russell said, the benefits of democracy are negative. He said, we are able to avoid many evils by having a democracy, but a democracy itself brings a lot of new evils. And I always say that democracy has a tendency to commit suicide. It has a suicidal tendency because it allows some elite to get into power and they ensure that good things are not happening or good things are happening only for a certain section of the society. Although our constitutional uh, fathers had uh, even broad objectives, the directives of state policy, the fundamental right, the preamble of the constitution and so on. The administration over a period of time, particularly in the late 60s, started deteriorating this country. Otherwise, I, I think we have even reasons to be proud till about probably uh, 60s, late 60s and so on. And you're all aware that uh, the emergency was imposed in 1975 is an aberration of our democracy, but it had certain benefits as well. At least the people were coming to the office in time. Factories were working, labor disputes were less, and so on. So sometimes you wonder whether democracy should have some kind of an interlude like this, so that the quality of public administration improves. But then the champions of democracy and champions of liberty will not accept this kind of aberrations. And certainly within the framework of democracy, we should try to improve the quality of governance in this country. Now, one of the things that I have been suggesting is uh, the transfer of power. At the moment, the power of the central state government is too centralized. And this has resulted in too much of, you know, abilities among the politicians to come to the assembly or to the parliament. Because there are so many benefits that they are able to get, invisible as well as visible benefits they are able to get. And uh, unfortunately, the electoral system that we have contributes to criminals and money power playing more important role in having representatives in our politics, in our uh, legislatures. So it is absolutely necessary for us to find some solution to see that when we get good candidates for the parliament as well as state uh, uh, legislatures. Number of suggestions have been made by not only individuals, the election commission, and also the Law Commission of India to improve the quality of the um, uh, electoral system, the quality of governance in this country. And uh, somehow or other, I get an impression that most of the political parties have a vested interest in the status quo. They are not very keen to have important, serious changes in our system of governance. And uh, some, some small incremental changes that they, that they uh, sponsor, that they try to implement, are also not effectively implemented. So it is necessary for our politicians to change their course of uh, performance and uh, the civil servants play a very important role in this area. I blame not only the politicians but also the civil servants of which I was a part that they did not take adequate um, care to ensure that uh, some of these changes are brought about 
as early as possible. It is not that they did not attempt, it is not that they did not have the intelligence to suggest these things, but then somehow they got misdirected by other considerations, political considerations or non-administrative considerations, with the result that the uh, governments were not uh, getting the importance that it deserved. I don't know, some of you must have read that the Shaw Commission's report where how uh, particularly during the emergency time, how the administration uh, was uh, not effectively done, even though the conditions were conducive. But another reason for our uh, poor performance is the fact that the judicial administration needs to be overall. Although the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and other judges have been suggesting the changes in some areas, the Supreme Court itself should be subject to certain changes. And unfortunately, there has been so much of discussion in the last so many years, but no action has demonstrably been taken. So it's very necessary. The second uh, important change to improve the quality of public governance in this country is to overhaul the judicial system. For example, uh, you know, we have, for example, the election commission has suggested that criminal ele elements who have been given a charge sheet by the court for certain serious, heinous offences. They should not be allowed to stand for the election. Normally, in Western countries, if a person is convicted, certainly the person is disqualified. And that judicial system is such that within a year or two, the judicial proceedings come to an end. But we have not only different levels of judicial administration, but also the time delays, the cases which are too many in the courts and they take their own time. With the result that the criminals who have been charged with serious offences have not been disqualified on the ground that they are innocent until they are convicted. So it is one of the areas where I think the suggestion has been made not only by us but by the law commission that if the, the prima facie case has been established by the court of competent jurisdiction then such person should be disqualified if the sentence for such crime was five years imprisonment and more. So this is the second area where probably we need to have a serious look at um, uh, improving the quality of governance. So the third area is the police administration in this country. Unfortunately, the police in the states have become hand tools of the politicians. And very few police officers are highly independent. For obvious reasons, obviously, they cannot continue to be in service if they cannot nod their head to some of the directives of the questionable politicians. So, police administration had come to the review of the, by a, to a review to the Supreme Court, and there is a famous uh, judgment of the Supreme Court in Prakash Shah's case, where they have said that uh, certain changes in the police administration need to be introduced. One of the uh, important recommendations that they made was to delete the politicians from the postings of the police officers of senior level, particularly, and that should be go. It should be seen through by a committee of impartial retired uh, persons who will decide whether the transfers, postings, promotions, and uh, foreign assignments, etc. They are all not decided by the politicians because politicians certainly would like to control the police, and that's why you find. Most of the chief ministers tend to have police administration under that control. And when we were in the election commission, we had many occasions where we had to deal with a number of uh, uh, police irregularities. Although, again, there are very exceptional police officers in Bihar. We had an officer who was willing to prevent uh, the candidate from even entering the jurisdiction or the constituency during the election time because he said he had the authority to do so. But then there are many police officers who have unfortunately been victims of pol uh, political uh, influence. So this is one area where we have to concentrate and ensure that the recommendations of the Supreme Court, not the police commission's recommendation, which was headed by Dharam Mira, and actually the Supreme Court direction should be complied with the state governments. They are not, uh, many states have not uh, really implemented the direction given by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court appointed a retired Supreme Court judge to coordinate with the various state governments as to why they are not implementing this judge. And still it is hanging fire. So this is the third important area where we need to uh, focus our attention. The fourth 
the, the one relating to political parties in this country. Unfortunately, we don't have a separate law governing the functioning of the political parties. Many countries have, or even some of the African countries have, but we do not have any uh, regulation of political parties through a separate law. There are a lot of uh, judgments uh, regulating the formation, the disputes in the political parties, and so on. But we do not have a separate law to deal with political parties. In my opinion, we should have a law which will look into not only the functioning of the political, the formation, the resolution, the disputes, and uh, the financial accountability of the political parties. One of the recent unfortunate developments that took place uh, about a couple of years back is the barrel bonds or the electoral bond which was introduced. There is, a, there is definitely a nexus between corporates and uh, the political parties and they have to give donation and in the name of transparency the finance minister introduced the bill which in my opinion makes the system more opaque. It is uh, the electoral bonds where money can be given without any uh, transparency and only thing it is put through a banking transaction. But this is going to increase the amount of money, the role of money in electoral politics. It's going to worsen the situation. We have been at least a number of uh, non-governmental organizations have been suggesting to the government to withdraw this barrel bond scheme because it is unfortunately probably in favor of only a limited number of political parties. Today, an, an individual, an independent individual cannot contest elections as the conditions exist. Because the money power is so is so widely prevalent that uh, an ordinary man cannot win the elections. Uh, uh, <coughs> I think I can take about ten minutes more. The working of the government needs to be made time bound by insisting that the government servant should deal with every grievance in writing within a particular time frame. For example, in Kerala, there is a system that I find very interesting and very useful. Any citizen can go to the collector's office. He need not meet anybody. There is a touch screen available outside the collector's office. You go and register your grievance. And within a week's time, they are bound to give a reply. And if it is not given, the citizen can question why I no reply has been given to this. And normally, at least an interim reply is given to such a uh, uh, situation, such a uh, grievance. And there's a remarkable uh, <coughs> contact of the government with the people. So it's worth trying in other um, <laughs> state governments as well. Then we have reducing the manpower in the government. One of the reasons for our budget going uh, astray is that the expenditure on administration is substantially very high. And I personally feel at least 30% of the manpower can be reduced if there is a proper uh, look at the way the government functions. Many functions of the government can be outsourced. There is no need for the government itself to perform. And it is easier to control the outsourced agency rather than the government servants working in various uh, areas. So this is one area where probably the government should seriously consider the need for having so many government employed. And at one stage we did stop recruitment, but again they have started uh, recruiting more people. And uh, the government has got a knack of, uh, you know, expanding itself. The other important uh, point is that most of the central agencies are located in and around Delhi. In one of the speeches that I gave in Hyderabad, I said over 30 to 40 institutions are located in Delhi, contributing to the congestion in Delhi. It could easily be avoided by taking them out. When I was additional secretary in the Ministry of Finance, I used to raise this in the cabinet meeting that this agency, for example, a committee is formed, or uh, for example, Road Research Institute, why should that be in Delhi? I don't understand. Then Financial Management Research Institute, again in Delhi. So there is a tendency, like Kutub Minar, they want to coexist in uh, Delhi itself around, and they don't want to move out. And there are a lot of vested interests in this. So there is a need for dispersing the government offices 
or at least the agencies which are working in Delhi, which uh, only contribute to confusion in administration. Setting a fast track course, I mentioned about judicial administration, I should have added on this, that cases of importance, particularly involving public personalities, should be disposed of within a period of one year. For example, you will be surprised to know in Singapore, the liquidation proceedings of a company has to be completed within a period of one year. We will not have any such time limit the cases. It may require setting up more codes, but I think there is certainly talent available to set up the codes to run the judicial system. And cases where serious crimes are committed, whether it is economic offenses or political offenses, they need to be given to fast track codes with a time limitation of one year. The institution of Lokpal and the Lokayuts, which are being set up now, in at least in some states and in the center, they need to be uh, refurbished, they need to be uh, strengthened. For example, the Central Vigilance Commission or the Central Bureau of Investigation, they are still under the control of the political masters. And they are being used certainly by every government. It is not only one particular party government we can raise this charge. Every government has been using it as a hand tool to harass some of the people that they don't like. So it is necessary, at least matters relating to character, should be with the Lokpal or Lokayuka through the CBC or CBI, and it should, they should not report to the political masters. In every uh, parliamentary constituency, they should set up an interfaith harmony group which will ensure that small issues occurring between different communities are eliminated at the earliest stage so that the dispute do not get magnified because of political interference. This is uh, one of the suggestions made by a retired uh, civil servant in Hyderabad that there is no need for many of these inter or communal riots which could have been avoided if only we can have an inter faith harmony group in each uh, parliamentary constituency. With all this, uh, uh, while I have tried to highlight some of the important areas, ultimately liberty does not come from the government, as Guru Wilson said, it comes only from the people. The people have to be vigilant, people have to assert their rights, and they have to ensure that whenever mistakes are committed, that they are immediately brought to the notice of the powers that be, and the powers that be should be communicative and transparent enough to make it uh, as early as possible to resolve the issue. Unfortunately, uh, we have been following a feudal system of governance in this country, partly because of the historical reasons where we always praise the rulers and we try to get some curry favors to the rulers. But I think that has to go. While the British who introduced us with the, so many changes and rules, they have changed remarkably. They are, you know, first of all, the trust between the government and the people, the trust between the government and the corporate or the business community. It's remarkable that they have changed, but we have continued to preserve the old tradition of colonial and feudal approach. So these are the issues which I thought I'd share with you. There are many areas which we can certainly go into the detail, but I thought that I must end here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.